Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on ultrasonic transducers, and specifically their radiated field patterns. The field radiated by an ultrasonic transducer can have a high degree of complexity, with both spatial and temporal variation. If we consider the field radiated by the transducer producing this impulsive signal, we can see that it contains many frequency components. It's got a very broad spectral bandwidth. Much of the concepts contained within this tutorial rely upon interference effects, and these are easiest visualized at one frequency only. Therefore, throughout this tutorial, we won't be looking at impulsive signals of the nature shown here, but instead we'll consider either continuous wave and tone bursts with a very narrow spectral bandwidth, or impulses which are just two cycles of a sinusoid. Similarly, when it comes to spatial variations, an ultrasonic transducer's output varies in three-dimensional space. Again, for ease of visualization, we'll be considering 2D variations only in this tutorial, and these are normally cross-sections of a transducer's output pattern. Finally, we could consider particle displacement or particle velocity in order to map our transducer's field, other variables available as well, but for the purposes of simplification, this tutorial will consider pressure distributions only. We'll start by considering a point source radiating at one frequency. As the wavefronts radiate away from the point source, we can see they form a circular, or in three dimensions, spherical wavefront. As the energy they contain, is spread out over a larger and larger surface area, we can see that their amplitude, denoted here by intensity of colour, diminishes as we move away from the point source. Let's consider a second point source alongside. This is also radiating at the same frequency. We notice that there are some components that are travelling in equal and opposite directions. In fact, if we consider the purely horizontally propagating component from the left-hand source, we can see that it is exactly matched by the purely left-going component from the right-hand source. Even for wavefronts that are propagating in diagonal directions, they have equal and opposite horizontal components, which will, through the principles of interference, cancel with one another. In fact, if we consider a region bounded by the centres of the two point sources, anywhere between the two, we find that there will be an interference pattern formed because the horizontal components are equal and opposite and will therefore cancel. The interaction of point sources is exactly the basis of a Huygens construction. Huygens was originally considering optical effects and specifically radiation through apertures and screens. However, his principles are equally applicable to an ultrasonic transducer. Here, we will decompose the transducer surface into a series of point sources. Each of these point sources has its circularly radiating wavefronts, which combine to give us the overall total wave field. If we consider that region, bounded by the transducer's radiating surface, we can see that, as drawn, there's an almost planar wavefront. In fact, if we decompose the surface into an infinitesimal number of point sources, we would see a completely planar wavefront. Outside of that region, we have circularly and spherically radiating components, which are indicative of diffraction. As we move from the idealized Huygens simplification to reality, we find that we get almost complete cancellation of those horizontal going components within the transducer's immediate region. And if we actually look at the output wave field, we can see that we have the planar wavefront that is often referred to as the plate or head wave, and then circularly spherically radiating components that are the edge wave components. In fact, as some of these edge waves propagate in front of the transducer, the left-going component from the right-hand edge 
and the right going component from the left hand edge, this largely dominates some of the radiated field pattern. And these give rise to some of our near field effects, as we'll see soon. But to start off with, we'll look at an animation of a pulsed transducer with a sort of short signal we see here. As we discussed in the introduction, for simplicity, we'll consider 2D representation only. So this particular transducer of radius 10 millimeters and center frequency of the pulse, one megahertz, has an axis of rotational symmetry. We're looking from R equals naught to R equals 40 millimeters in the simulation. Here we can see the edge wave radiating out along with the plate wave. We can also see the edge wave from the far edge. And we can see there is very little additional signal behind the propagating wavefronts. Here's the contribution again from that far edge coming in. And we can see how everything combines to give us a very simple wave field. In contrast with the previous case, we'll now drive the same transducer with a continuous sinusoid. Therefore, radius remains 10 millimeters and frequency one megahertz. We can see numerous edge and plate wave components. But because they're much longer signal durations, there's far more opportunity for their interference. And we see numerous on axis, axial, maxima and minima. In fact, the last axial maxima and minima are shown. Importantly, if we look at the periphery of the wave field, we can see that there are numerous side waves. Because these components are well outside the edge of the transducer, they arise purely from the interaction of the edge wave components from the near and the far edges. Also, if we look at the region shown in red, there's considerable variation of pressure amplitude within this region. This is often described in textbooks as the classical near field of the transducer. But it's important to realize this is only evident when we're driving a transducer with a continuous wave. If we use much shorter signals, there's far less opportunity for interaction of edge and plate wave components, and many of these near field phenomena disappear. Let's now consider the axial and transverse profiles for these two different excitation types. Beginning with continuous wave and looking at the acoustic axis, which is shown here in black, we find that if we extract the time average pressure profile, we get the trace shown below. Similarly, if we look at the position of the last axial maximum and look at the transverse profile at this location, we see the transverse profile plotted. Comparing this with the impulsive excitation, and again, looking at the time average pressure, we find a very much simpler axial distribution. Many of the axial maxima and minima have disappeared completely. And even though we do have maximum and minima, the variation in their amplitude is much smaller. Similarly, in the transverse profile, we have a much smoother response. So it's important to realize that the difference between these two is just because of the interaction of edge wave components. With short signals, we get far less interaction. Now let's look at what happens with a focus transducer. The radius is the same as we've used previously, 10 millimeters, and we have a geometric focus of 20 millimeters. The center frequency remains the same as well. In the CW case, we can clearly see the focus, but we can also see some side lobes to the lateral extents of the focal plane. Comparing this with impulsive excitation, we have again the same focus, but very much less signal to the periphery, and so outside of the main focal region. Now turning to the axial and transverse profiles, in much the same way as was done for the planar radiator. The time average pressure distribution along the acoustic axis of the focus transducer when driven with continuous wave signals is shown here. The black curve 
now illustrates the same time average pressure when we use impulsive excitation. We could see there's much less variation in the region as we approach focus. And although the focal length and focal depth of field are much the same, there's also a much simpler post-focus region for the impulsive excitation. A similar trend can be seen when we look at the transverse profile. Here, the side lobes are clearly evident for the continuous wave case. But for the pulsed wave case, we have a simple monotonically decreasing function. So, in summary then, we've seen that diffraction causes ultrasonic fields to be complex, even when the transducer radiating them is simple. And the choice of excitation signal can substantially alter the radiated field pattern. We hope you found this interesting. If you did, please come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics tutorial videos.